In this video, we'll talk about uh, systemic lupus erythematous, its presentation and how we approach it and how do we diagnose it in addition to the management. So SLE is a systemic disease. It involves many organs and we can metaphorically say that it can involve any organ. And it can present with non-specific symptoms. In addition, it is actually a diagnosis of exclusion. So let's talk about some of the common symptoms. First, I'll start with fatigue and arthralgia. The reason I want to mention these and focus on them because the presence of one of them is around 90% sensitive, which is very good in practice to realize that if this patient has SLE, they should have either of these 90% of the time. Now, the arthralgia, we have to know what type of arthralgia they have. It mainly involves the metacarpophalangeal and the proximal interphalangeal joints in the hands, and it is symmetrical bilaterally. And it usually have the typical symptoms of inflammatory arthritis, which is swelling, tenderness, and warmth. Now, one important distinction is on the X-ray, they are non-erosive compared to rheumatoid arthritis or gout, for example. Now, what about the fever? The fever is very important here because if the patient comes to the emergency department and they have SLE as a history, if they come with an infection, how would you differentiate the fever as part of acute SLE versus acute infection? And one of the main things or one of the ways we can do that is give them NSAIDs. Unless they have contraindications to NSAIDs, the reason is SLE patients usually respond pretty well to NSAID and that can help with diagnosing the flares. Then we have Raynaud's phenomena which is present in around 50% of the patients with SLE. And also the oral ulcers is an important symptom that we need to look for and usually the patient has painless ulcers compared to aphthous ulcers for example. Now, if the patient has a history of SLE and they present with shortness of breath or chest pain, then you have to think about the cardiopulmonary involvement regarding the SLE. And the cardiac involvement, you have to think about autoimmune endocarditis, which we call Lippmann sac endocarditis. And here the patients present with atypical endocarditis compared to the infective endocarditis where they have systemic symptoms, fever and fatigue and the classic manifestations of infective endocarditis. Here instead they present with valvular disease, i.e. for example aortic regurgitation, which can cause shortness of breath, or the patient can present with stroke symptoms secondary to these vegetations that can cause an emboli going to the brain. And the other differential for shortness of breath or chest pain is the pulmonary manifestation of SLE. And these are pleuritis or pleural effusion. Now the pleural effusion here is important to know that it is exudative and the patient will have bilateral involvement in addition to increased LDH. And compared to rheumatoid arthritis, the main distinctive feature is going to be the glucose levels, where they are slightly low or normal in SLE and very low in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Next we'll talk about renal involvement in patients with SLE. Now the manifestation here is going to be mainly urine analysis with the protein and elevation of the creatinine. And we'll talk more about this when we talk about the diagnostic criteria. Now the skin manifestation is one of the most commonly asked questions when it comes to patients with SLE. It's also important from practical standpoint. Now one important thing before talking about anything regarding the skin manifestations, it's a clinical diagnosis and no need for any biopsy to diagnose SLE rash. Now we have the three main categories. The first category is acute cutaneous lupus erythematous rash. Then we have the subacute cutaneous lupus and the chronic cutaneous lupus erythematous rash. Now the acute cutaneous lupus erythematous is basically the other name for malar rash and it is very important because it's present in around 100% of patients with SLE in their time course or timeline of the disease. Now it can appear before any other symptoms, so if the patient comes with malar rash and they don't have any other symptoms, you still have to think about SLE as it can present as a first sign in these patients. 
Next, we have the subacute cutaneous lupus erythematous. It is the least common among these and the least to be asked about, but still you need to know it. It's a psoriatic annular-like rash, and that can be confused with psoriasis, especially that it has similar locations in the shoulders and neck, and it is present in around 50% of the patients. Now, the last category is the chronic rash, and this is the discoid lupus erythematous. These patients have red raised and disc-like shaped rash and scarring is very common in these patients and the most common sites are the cheeks and the scalp area. Now we need to know how to diagnose this Ali. It's a stepwise approach. First question you have to ask yourself, can I explain all the symptoms that the patient presenting with with any other disease? If the answer is no, then you can proceed with the criteria. You need four out of 11 of these clinical manifestations and labor laboratory manifestations as well. I try to divide them into four main categories so it becomes easier to go through them. You don't have to memorize them, just understand them and try to relate them together, let's say. Now, the first category is the mucosa and the skin manifestations. Then we have organ inflammation. And after that, we have the end organ damage. And the last one is lab abnormalities. Now in mucosa and skin manifestations, we are talking about the presence of malar rash, oral ulcers, the painless ones, and discoid rash in addition to photosensitivities. Now when we're talking about organ inflammation, we are referring to serocytis and arthritis. And arthritis is going to be two or more joints. And serocytis is pruritus or pericarditis. Now, organ damage, mainly the kidneys. And we talked about the presence of proteinuria, three plus dipsticks, or more than half gram per day, which is not nephrotic range at this point. And the central nervous system as an organ damage, and here we're talking about seizures or psychosis. It does not involve any depression or any decreased cognition or any of the other symptoms. It's only seizures or psychosis. Now when it comes to labs, we're talking about three important labs. The first one is CBC and you need one abnormality, whether it's uh, thrombocytopenia, anemia, or leukopenia, etc. Now, the next one is positive ANA, and the last category is any other antibodies that are positive, and these are anti-Smith, anti-double-stranded DNA, and anti-phospholipid antibodies. Now, important to know that anti-Smith and double-stranded DNA, these are the most specific but they are not necessarily sensitive. Actually, anti-double-stranded DNA is around 70% sensitive, while Smith is around 30% sensitivity only. That's why we like to use double-stranded DNA to monitor the activity of SLE as well as the renal function. When it comes to antiphospholipid antibodies, we are talking about anti-cardiolopin antibodies as well as lupus anticoagulant. So you need to rule out any other disease that can explain the patient's symptoms, and you need four out of these 11, then you can diagnose SLE bang. Now let's talk about SLE treatment. So everyone with SLE should be started on hydroxychloroquine and NSAIDs for pain management. Now after that, we can categorize patients with SLE based on the complications they have. If they have the skin, CBC or joint complications only, then we call them mild SLE. And these only require short and low dose prednisone, and that should be enough. Now, if the patient have renal or central nervous system involvement, then they are in severe complication or severe SLE manifestations, then they need high dose steroids and longer course of steroids in addition to immunosuppressant medications, which are, or the best ones we use is cyclophosphamide and mycophenolate. Now let's talk what kills patients with SLE. We can divide it into two categories, early stages of the disease and late stages of the disease. 
In early stages, it's mainly kidneys, central nervous system, and infection. While late in the course of the disease, then coronary artery disease is the most common cause at that time. This is it for SLE. See you guys in the next video.